everyone. Welcome to the North and Artist Conversation. My name is Mark Kelly. I am your host uh, on this amazing journey. Um, thank you so much for checking us out. Um, really do appreciate it. We're, um, we're, we're in December. It's hard to believe. And it's, it's kind of one of those cool times of year where, uh, you know, where the days get longer. I, I've definitely noticed the days have gotten a lot longer. The sun is out uh, for a lot more than normal. Um, you know, and you know, not only in the it's coming up earlier in the morning, but also longer in the evening. Um, and uh, sunshine. Although, as of the recording of this podcast, uh, we're due for about I think we're day three of being in some cloudy, overcast rubbish. Um, so it's not that good at the moment. But uh, producer Andrew, um, you're you're uh, driving behind me in the desk tonight, aren't you? Yes, I am. Now we're going to do things a little bit differently for this podcast, aren't we? Yes, we are. We are. Um, now, we've been doing this for nearly 18 months now. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go off my wide. I'm going to go to the to my camera. We've been doing this for nearly 18 months now. And we've had some amazing conversations with some unbelievable people. Now, along the way, you kind of m- meet these people and you have these little podcasts that are kind of a little bit... There's something special about them, would you say, producer mm. Andrew? Yeah, it's yeah. I think I think the one you're about to um, intro, I kind of described as a bit of shock and awe for us. I think it was like eight podcasts in. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah. So, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to repeat a podcast, um, but for a very specific reason. Um, the reason we're doing it is because this one was recorded last year and was recorded um, sort of quite early on in the piece, and then we sort of left it for a little bit. Um, until that artist had their the launch of, of what they had, um, there's a, there's a lot to kind of note and look out for here. Um, obviously, we were still it was quite quite new. We were yeah. still sort of getting out, finding our feet, getting our way around the podcast. Still going, still going. Don't freeze! Don't freeze! Don't freeze! That's on the it. computers. That's it. Um, oh God, it's crashed again. Yeah. Oh, uh, frame skips. Um, frame drops. But now, um, you know, we're the what we've been doing, what we do now versus what we did back then are two very different things. So, mm. for this particular guest, um, I guess the big the big reason I wanted to pick them is because this is a, this was a podcast that completely caught us off guard. And it was out of left field, man. But it was, yeah. and it was. I think it's for, for. I think from my perspective, it was one of those podcasts where I felt um, criminally underprepared. And um, when you watch it or, or listen to it, um, you'll understand exactly what I mean. Um, you know, a lot of the guests we've had on, you know, they'll they'll talk and they'll share some stuff about their their lives, etc., and they'll talk about their art um but this one was this one was uh, interesting very cool um i think this person is an amazing talent and i have nothing but the hugest amount of admiration and respect for them not only what they've done but what they continue to do with um their lives and they are definitely someone that i look at and go yeah that's that's a talent and that's someone i um you know i can look at and i can aspire to um so uh this week we're going to uh do a rerun of lauren roach's podcast um now as i said before um if any of this information um is uh, triggering um or is upsetting in any way shape or form um we support an organization called 1737 um, you can call or text them. Um, they're 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're, they're there to help. They're there to listen. And if you need that next level of support, they can actually put you in touch with a counsellor that may be located somewhere around New Zealand, but someone that is on call and available for you. So whew, here we go, people. Um, this is really interesting. Let's dive back in. And have a look at the conversation with Lauren Roach. Well, Lauren Roach. 
thank you very much for joining us uh, in the Five Elements studio for the Northern's Art Artists Conversation. Lovely to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, look, it's it's absolutely mm. a pleasure. Um, you know, uh, obviously we've we've sort of had a good chat beforehand, so you got a little bit of idea as to um, you know kind of the format and what's going to happen and go on. So, yeah. Um, I guess the big thing will probably be just sort of we'll just go from the start and then sort of start from there. So your your full name is Lauren Kim Roach. It is. And you have got quite an interesting background. I have. You do. You do. <laughs> um, now, you're an author. I am. And, um, and we're going to get to that a little bit later on, because obviously you've got a book coming out soon, yeah. which is super exciting. We're going to def definitely dive into that, because I can't wait to hear about that. But this isn't your first book either. No. No, you've got another couple of books, don't you? Uh, memoirs. Memoirs, yeah. Memoirs. Um, they were called... Bent, Not Broken and Life on the Line. Now, they're, what are they about? Tell, tell me about them. They were the story of my life. Okay. Um, I started to write them probably 25 years ago. Okay. I was a GP working on the Kapiti Coast and I had an episode of really severe depression and I attempted suicide and lived through it. Okay. But realised that there was a lot of stuff in my past, a lot of things that I'd done that I'd never really come to terms with. Okay, sure. And to try and figure them out in my head and to get some power back over them, mm -hmm. I decided to write them down. Oh, wow. And um, the books were never meant for publication. They were just kind of a diary, you know, who am I? Yeah. And why, when I have done so well in my life, to become a doctor, a GP, to own my own home, things that hadn't happened for my mum and dad. Yeah. Why did I have to pull the plug on myself or try to? Wow. So by writing these things yep. about my life, yep. I took the power back. Okay. So what had happened in my life, I was um, born in 1961. Okay. So... I'm 61 this year. Golly, I, I just don't know where the time went. <laughs> I know. I know. Tell me, I turned 47 last month. And yeah. I was just oh, like, you baby. Man, 40, thank you very kindly. <laughs> it's nice to recall that. <laughs> so I was the eldest of three girls. Yeah. Um, and we lived in Strathmore Park in a state house. Um, and sometimes we live with my grandparents, mum's parents. Okay, yep, yep. And... Um, Dad was kind of itinerant. He had different kinds of jobs. Sometimes he was an engineer. Mm -hmm. He worked at a little engineering place. Other times he jumped out of helicopters to catch live deer for farming. So Dad was a guy who could do anything. Those are very different yes. jobs. So, well, Jack, Jack of all trades, really. He was, yeah. So essentially you moving and studying to become a doctor, that's a very fixed profession, isn't it? So yeah. sort of completely opposite from what he did. It was, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. right. But as, as I got older and got to understand my dad, I realised that he was a very literate and undereducated man for his intellect. Oh, wow, okay. He was a really cool guy. Yep. But, you know, when we were young, you... you don't know stuff like that. No, no. So, well, yeah. So dad, no. dad went to live in Australia for a while when I was about five or six. Okay. And I remember my mum sitting at the table drinking and smoking and crying. And she had these three little girls in the state house and dad had gone. And she didn't really know if he was going to come back or if we were really going to live with him in Aussie. And um, eventually dad came through. Mm-hmm. And we all moved to Australia and lived there for a couple of years. Oh, wow. Um, mum and dad split up during that time. And mum and her three kids moved in with another man and his three kids. And we lived in a caravan. So a blended family with two parents and six kids. And, yeah, and a and little a, and wee a tiny and a caravan. caravan. Yeah, yep. wow. Yep. Not the big ones that we see nowadays. No, no, but no. The, the small ones that everyone sort of... That the Kiwi summer type caravans that we kind of all associate, yeah? Yep. Okay, Like wow. one of those, like a little budgie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Oh, man, yeah. that's crazy. <laughs> um, so life was difficult. You know, we didn't go to school sometimes. Yep. Um, I remember once eating dog, bis dog biscuits with tomato sauce because we had no money. 
mum right. and her wow. boyfriend, um, they would get work picking grapes or picking tomatoes or whatever. And um, we lived in the caravan. They parked it outside an abandoned house for a while on a vineyard in Barmara while they picked grapes. Now, Bar- that's Barmara's in Australia. South Australia. Still in Australia. Yeah. Yep. yep, sure. Um, life got difficult. There was sexual abuse of some of the kids, and I was the eldest. Um, eventually, my grandmother, mum's mother, paid for me to come back to New Zealand by myself and to be cared for her by her and granddad. Okay. And mum and the others came back several months later. Right, so you all sort of, you all eventually came back we together all, as, a, as like a, a, a big blended family? Yes. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Yeah. There was um, quite a lot of violence between mum and her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. We moved out of grandma's place, moved up to Featherston. I remember one day when mum's boyfriend threw a knife at her head and it just missed her head and it went into the wall in the kitchen, stabbed wow. into the wall. Yeah. You know, it was nasty stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So eventually mum sent him back to Australia with his kids and we all moved in again with grandma. Okay. So my sisters and I had a very stable relationship with our maternal grandparents. We would come back and forth from grandma and granddad's place. Sure, yep. Um, When I was 13, um, we were living with grandma. Mm Mm-hmm. My mum was really unwell. She um, had a lot of drugs and alcohol and problems with depression. One morning, uh, we got up. She was angry with me, and she strangled me until I was unconscious. Um, My sister Tracy saw it happen. Okay. Mum, she was just a mess. She ended up in Porirua Hospital in the secure psych ward right and was yep. there for a while okay um now the the is the psych ward still going i think put it to a hospital still is still going yeah she, mum was in lomond which was the the lockup for people who really had pretty big problems right i i, I think it's still going because I, I i i had a, a childhood friend uh end up Somewhere in Wellington, there was actually a feature article and story done on him. So I, right. I think it was Porirua, but yeah. So no, please carry on. Yeah. Wow, fascinating. So she ended up in there, yeah. and one of my aunties said, "Come and live with me." So I moved up to live with my auntie in Auckland when I was fourteen. Oh wow, nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one day we heard from Mum. Yeah, she had moved into a flat with a new boyfriend with my two sisters. Okay. My sisters were away on holiday because it was Christmas holidays, January. Nice, yeah. We got a phone call that my mum had committed suicide. Oh, wow. And um, she'd been by herself. Her boyfriend had gone out. Yeah. Her three daughters were scattered around the place. Nobody Mm -hmm. needed her. Right, okay. And she died alone of a drug overdose. Yeah. I went from being someone who had been quite studious and smart at school to Mm -hmm. somebody who was quite smart at school and (laughs) the teachers weren't happy, you know. I I once spoke to a woman in a prison and she said, you've got a lot of teeth for someone so smart. Oh, right. And (laughs) I I can imagine (laughs) my fourth form teachers thinking the same thing. Oh, wow. (laughs) Wow. So... I left school. I was 14 years old. My mother had died. Yeah. I was being really naughty at school. They yeah. didn't like me very much. Yeah. I wanted to be back in Wellington with my grandma, not up in Auckland. Okay, sure. And so I ran away and I went to live with my grandma again. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're, wow, oh man, lots of, there's so much to unpack. <laughs> I know, sorry. No, it's okay. kind of <laughs> No, it's fine. Um, so... 25 years ago, you start this journey of writing. Yes. And you're obviously writing all of these things, things and events that have happened to you. But wait, there's more. Uh, but wait, there's more. It's a free set of Ginsu steak knives. <laughs> um, so you're, you're, you're writing all, this stuff, all of these things down. It's all very trauma-based. Yes, yes. And you're using it as a... <sighs> As a form of therapy. Okay, right. Yeah. I was just, yeah. 
Because sometimes when your head is full of chaos and trauma and stuff, Mm -hmm. it's really hard to dissect the things out. And it's really hard to get some sort of linear narrative and make some sense of it. Sure. Yep. But when you write it down, you have power over those words. Mm. You can screw that paper up. You can burn it up. You can rub bits out. Yeah. And you can make sense of things. You can say, well, this led to that. Mm -hmm. And then I did something really stupid. So if I can go back from the really stupid thing and see if there was a sign that I wasn't coping so well, see if there was some sort of signpost looking back that I was about to do something really stupid and calamitous. So you can almost see if there's what a, a, a pattern? That if it's, there's a, a pattern, a, yeah. Something that's, that gets established. So you can almost become more self-aware. Yes, yeah. And so you can avoid repeating yeah. those mistakes again later on in life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. So you're, you're, you're going through, you're reevaluating. Yeah. And you, what do you see? I see that when life is really good, I start to get suspicious that something's happening in the background. Okay. Not like conspiracy theory No, no, suspicious. not at all. No, okay, just, right. just the sense that this is too good. So you're waiting this for the... This is too good. The, I'm waiting for the hammer yeah, blow the penny to or drop. whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then I start, I started to not sleep so well. Okay, okay. So if I got to the point where I wasn't sleeping well and I thought... I need a sleeping pill. That was a sign that I needed to do something else rather than let things waft out of my control yeah. and do something dumb. Huge, that took a lot of thinking uh, and a lot yeah, of writing. That, that must have, but what a huge revelation to have. Yeah. You know, because you, you would have, you know, as you're going through this process and you're First book was published in 2002? 2000. 2000. Yeah. So you first three years, you're, you're just frantically scribbling yep. all of this information out. And, you know, obviously you're still working, mm. um, but, you know, you're, you're as these things are coming to you, you're writing them all down. Yeah. Um, when you have that big aha moment, how powerful is that for you? That was enormously powerful. Yeah. Because before then, everything had felt as though almost like the world was against me. And no matter what I did, it was going to turn to shit. Because it did, over and over. Yep. But by writing it down and seeing that there were actually some subtle signs that I needed to look after myself better, Mm -hmm. I could take those signs and then exercise some more or drink a bit less or read a bit more or go to the beach or walk in the bush. Some self-help. Yeah. Some self, yeah. self-care. Self-healing. Self-healing. Yeah, absolutely. You, using yeah. the physician of the intuition. That's a great phrase. What is, let's talk about what does that mean? That's from Clarissa Pinkola Estes who wrote Women Who Run With The Wolves. She's got this wonderful... Um, I'm, I'm listening to it in the car at the moment. It's called the the body consort, I think, or the it's got the word body in it. Okay, right. And she talks all about how the body has wisdom and how that we are our own healers mm-hmm. if we listen to our intuition. And sometimes we drug our intuition with alcohol or sleeping pills or DAC or too much exercise or too much sex or whatever. The, the the drugging is the addiction. Yeah, it is. So, or, and it deadens that intuition right. yep. that okay. tells you how to heal yourself. Yep. Okay. So, the physician of the intuition. The physician of the intuition. Yep. Write that down, Andrew. Yep. It's really good. <laughs> it's really good. Um. So, as the, you know, you've, how many, how many books did you, how many notebooks worth of stuff did you end up getting through yeah before you know you kind of went okay cool i've had the first what purge mm. or yeah. you know i mean I, I i sort of picture it like um the movie seven where brad pitt and morgan freeman break into the guy the the uh, the, the main villain's house and it's like literally 
hundreds of books all over the bookshelf yeah. of his yeah. random <laughs> mad scram <laughs> scribblings and stuff like that yeah. you know um you know were, were there were there sort of like were there like a was there a lot of books or was yeah. it all like scattered you know because you could you could either do it on um in books or you can do it on things like post-its and just have bits of pieces was yeah. it really structured for you or no there, there were random jottings yeah. here and there yeah um but it's on the computer. Yeah, okay. I find, though, that if I want to write something that goes direct from my heart and is not thought out too much, yeah. writing with a fountain pen on paper, right? the words come out better. They yeah. come out clearer and they have um, a better emotional content than something that's yeah, that, that's no, tight. Yeah, that's the actual... Is it the physical action that does it, it for you? I think it is. I think it is. Because, I mean, tappy, tap, tap, tap is... Mm. So impersonal, so clinical. Yeah, you know, it does. Um, writing sort of very much more, you know, because we we've all got our own styles of handwriting and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you know, very personalised. Well, you know that I was a doctor, so you know I'm pretty pretty legible for a doctor actually. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, I'm right-handed, so you know I don't smudge as I go. Right. Okay, that's awesome. Mm. So you've got all of your books worth of material. Yeah. And as you said earlier on, you didn't have you didn't sit out with a conscious decision to publish no so what turned that moment to go okay maybe i have something here yeah what walk me through that process what happened was that we need to step back a little okay, bit let's okay step back. let's step back when i was 20 mm -hmm. um i was working as a prostitute Okay. Um, I had been New Zealand's first teenaged pregnant G-string wearing fire eating stripper when I was 17. I okay. worked in a place called The Hole in the Wall in Wellington. Right. Okay. And um, what well, I had my baby. Yes. I lived with my grandma with my baby. Yep. He was born when I was 17. Okay. Then I worked as a, a prostitute on the street mm -hmm. and then in a massage parlour. And I met up with a guy who was the detective sergeant, second in charge of the Wellington Drug Squad, and we began to date. Okay. Ah. Wow. <laughs> wow. And I was on antidepressants. Okay. And he said, you should stop those because, you know, if you really loved me, you wouldn't be depressed. So you should throw your medicine away. Of so course. I did. Yeah. That's what everyone. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And then got more depressed and attempted suicide and woke up in intensive care in Wellington Hospital. And when I was there, I had this epiphany that I had made a mess of things. Mm -hmm. I had a fourth form education. I had a baby. I didn't have any certificated skills. You know, I'd learned some nice things in the massage parlour. I'd learned the importance of touch. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in an awful way. Yeah, yeah. And I'd learned how to connect with people mm -hmm. on more than just a sexual, physical way. Developed empathy? I had. Okay. And yep. intuition yep. and an understanding of people. Mm hmm I didn't need to end up dead and young like my mum was. My mum died at 32. Wow. And the only way that I could get out of the path that I was on was to get an education. Sure. So I decided to go back to high school. Right. And I did three years at high school. So school C, sixth form bursary? Yep. But yep. school C, even though I'd left school in the fourth form, school C was too easy for me. So I was bumped oh, up wow. to sixth form in that first year. Okay, cool. Um, got UE accredited. Yeah. Then did um, some seventh form papers. Found I was pregnant with my second child, who was the son of the detective sergeant in the drug squad. Yes. Who I was still going out with. Yep. Then went back and did a third year, having made the decision that I wanted to get a degree in science or in health. Okay. And the decision to work in health was because I wanted to do something that was so big that it would negate all the bad stuff that I'd done. Because I thought then that being a sex worker was bad. Sure, you yeah. know, a little gang of us used to rob Korean sailors of their wallets, you know, we used to do really, really yucky stuff. Also back then as well, there was a lot of stigma 
Yeah, there was. Well, yeah, stigma. it wasn't wasn't legal. No, no, definitely not. And we did some pretty scody things, you know. Scody. Scody. Oh God, I haven't heard that word in years. <laughs> Scody, that's a brilliant word. Oh man, that's oh, cool. Dear. Carmen told me off. Yeah. She actually told all of us off that, you know, this this is not what you do. Now that's the that is the legendary Carmen. The is that legendary right? Carmen. Yeah, yes. wow. Um, because they were a they were a well known cultural icon yeah. throughout New Zealand. Yeah. And, and you're getting chewed out by Carmen by Carmen who also bought me Eskimo pies when I was pregnant so how's that <laughs> Carmen liked that's Eskimo very pies cool. that's very cool that's amazing so yeah. you you've you've made this decision to yeah. to essentially uh, wipe the red from the ledger yeah that's, so that, that you, was the idea so that you you're back in the black again yeah yeah when I did sixth form, I realized that I was really good at science. Okay. Now, I knew before that I could write. You know, I, I used to be good at the creative writing and stuff like that in mm -hmm. school. Yeah. Wasn't that interested in the other stuff. But I suddenly realized, hey, I can do science and I love people. Mm -hmm. And men in the massage parlor told me I had very healing hands. I bet. <laughs> Jesus, I bet they did. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> So I decided to try for med school, okay. and um, I got in. Of course you did. So I got into med school at Otago Uni. Went, yes. Went down there with my son, Paulie, yep. who's my second born. He's autistic. Mm -hmm. So he moved down with me. Chris stayed with my grandma. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and, and things between yourself and the detective at this time? We're pretty hairy. Okay, and right. We, yeah, we ended up okay, separating. So, so he's in Wellington, you're in Otago. Yep. Naturally, the distance. There's yep. no, no internet back then. No. 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 It's all toll calls on the phone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One night, I was so annoyed by him because he was quite obsessive that I pulled the telephone. No, I left the telephone off the hook because oh, you couldn't yeah. pull it out of the no, wall. No, you couldn't. They were hardwired in. They, they were. And yeah. the exchange would put through this buzzing noise. If you left your phone off the hook and someone wanted to ring you. Yeah. And I put pillows on it. So he had policemen bang on my door at two o'clock in the no, morning. to do like a welfare say, check. Or, yeah. To say he was concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's absolutely crazy. Yeah. So you're in Otago. Yeah. You're beginning this brand new journey. Yeah. Of becoming a doctor. Yes. Now we don't know what sort of doctor at this stage no. because there's lots of different types. Oh yeah. Um. So you're you're going through and you're doing this and you. How many years is something like that take? Well, there's medant, which is the first year which I did at Victoria. Mm -hmm. Then there's two preclinical years which I did in Otago. Yes. Then there's three clinical years which I did in Wellington. Then you do your house surgeon years. Yeah. And then if you want to become a specialist, you do registrar years so it's a minimum of seven years so that's essentially seven years not only total study but that's on the job work experience and training as well that's the, yeah from the fourth um from the from fourth fifth, year fourth year onwards okay yeah, so you're that's on when the you're walks. yeah so you you're kind of um i don't even know what i equate it to like house or er or yeah. something like that where you know, you have the new the newbies come in and they, they get paired up with a senior doctor. That's it, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. right. Okay, so you're going through, you're doing all of that. Yeah. Um, and you're in Wellington? Yes. Okay, cool. So I'm in Wellington and I'm working as a junior doctor in the city where I'd been a sex worker. The first job I'd ever had out of school too was cleaning the corridors of Wellington Hospital. Wow. That was my first job. So one of the weirdest things that happened in those early days, I'm walking along the corridor in Wellington Hospital, the part of the corridor I had cleaned as a 15-year-old, I'm wearing my white coat, yep. and this guy comes towards me, and he's got a clerical collar on, yep. right? So he's a hospital chaplain. Yep. Yep. He used to be the manager of the massage parlor where I worked, and he looked at me, and I looked at him and it was like, no fucking no way. way. No way, yeah. Way. And you have that moment where you're like, I know you. And he's like, I know you. Yeah, it was yeah. more than a moment. We had to go and have a coffee and convince <laughs> each other that we were both the real thing. And we'd both done this big change. Yeah. And it was, yeah, that was a very funny moment.
Northern Artist Conversation proudly supports 1737. 1737 are a free service uh, that you can contact either via phone or text message. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, on their website, 1737.org.nz, um, they say, are you feeling stressed or just need to talk to someone? Are you feeling down or a bit overwhelmed? Do you know someone who is feeling out of sorts? Whatever it is, they're there for you. Free call or free text anytime, 24 hours a day, and you'll get to talk with a trained counsellor or talk with a peer support worker. Their service is completely free. They offer brief one-on-one -on -one counselling support sessions for those people that need it a little bit more than normal. Please do not be afraid to reach out if you need support or if you know someone else that needs support as well. 1737 are a fantastic service and we here at the Northern Artist Conversation are very, very proud to support what they do. 1737, free text or free call. So you and the chaplain are sitting down, having this coffee, essentially yep. having this holy shit moment yep. where you both realize that your past lives uh, are now completely different from the lives that you currently have because yep. you've both made positive changes and turned them all around. Yep. Um, are you, where to from there? Where do things go from there onwards? Because, I mean... As someone that is is known you and has been aware of your creativity and you being a doctor as well, this is all absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And I, a lot of the the people that are going to watch or listen will have just no clue, mm. no clue whatsoever. So take us on the journey. You've you've had your coffee. You're yeah. in your fourth year yeah. when all of this happens. Yeah. Where do now are you in between? We were talking very yeah. very quickly. There's a, there's a really cool story that you left out, which is you, <laughs> I'm sorry, you're going to have to just clarify that for me. What happened at the age of 16? I was walking in Wellington yes. along the beach yes. to my job in, in, in an insurance company. I became an insurance clerk right. for a while after cleaning the hospital. Cleaning the hospital, yep, yeah. okay. And there was this beautiful big red ship pulled mm -hmm. in at the overseas terminal. It was an icebreaker called the Polar Star. Okay. When I was a child, mum used to take us every now and then onto American ships when they were in port. And yes. we thought, how yes. cool this yeah. was. Yeah. Well, this ship was full of Americans on its way down to Antarctica. And I met up with some of them. They were really cool guys. Yeah. Anyway, they went to the Antarctic and I wrote letters. And then one day the ship was back in port in an unscheduled return from the Antarctic because she'd broken down. Okay, yep. And I thought, you know, I'd really like to go to America, but I've got no money. So here's the ship. So I stowed away. I hid in a space on the ship. A couple of the crewmen helped me. Yeah. Hid on the ship for 20 days in a fan compartment as it sailed from Wellington to Seattle. For Just for context, roughly what size is a fan compartment? Well, it was right under the bridge yes. and it went the width of the ship. Okay, oh, okay. so it was a right. very long space, but it was very narrow. So it was probably five foot. And I'm five foot five. I'm sorry, I've never got used to the metric stuff. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. 165 centimetres. Yeah. Well, 55. Well, yeah, we'll go so, with that. Yeah. So <laughs> it was too narrow for me to lay flat. Yes. Right? Yeah. So a crew member brought me a mattress and yeah. we wedged the mattress across the width, no, across the ship from bow to stern. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was crunched up. Yeah. Also, the ceiling was too low for me to sit up properly. So for 20 days, in the complete dark, I curled up on a mattress. Yeah. I peed in a tin. I would not poo for 21 days because I didn't want anyone having to chuck that overboard. Yeah, me. fair enough. So I just, I hid on the ship. I got out in Seattle. Yeah. Um, the crew member who had helped me get to Seattle took me down to stay with his family. They lived in Arizona. Yeah. Um, they 
I got drunk because I was 16 and stupid and I told them that I'd stowed away on his ship. So they shipped me off to California to my uncle, my dad's brother lived right, in California. Yes, yes, okay. But Dr. Hook, who was a band who I'd seen in Wellington, yes, were performing and I wanted to go and see them. So I ran away from my uncle, hitchhiked across the United States to Texas. Yeah. Caught up with Dr. Hook. Ended up, it's it's a, it was a long and crazy story, but I ended up in the Dallas County Jail as as an illegal alien. They shipped me. I actually I ended up in Tarrant County Juvenile, and then they moved me to the Dallas County Jail. Okay, and I was held in prison for three weeks until my father paid my fare back to New Zealand. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so. I've... So I was like the Ingham twins, but there was only one yeah, of me, yeah, and yeah, I was a yeah. bit more articulate. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so hang on, let me. Get, I've just got to. <laughs> so for twenty days and twenty nights, yep. you're in something the size that's smaller than most people's toilets. Yes. Yeah. Um, going number ones only. Yep. And you're being what funneled food by one of the crew members. Yeah, he would turn up every day or sometimes every second day yeah. when he could sneak into this fan okay. compartment yeah. because you know it was quite a low hatch yeah. that he had to sneak through yeah. and then have a torch and come and find find me. you and bring mm. you some food yeah and then you end up in seattle which is sort of the it's the west coast yeah quite right up, up the top up the top not too far from the canadian border yeah and then you go to arizona yep which is one of the warmer states, yep. sort of in the middle, lower middle. Yep. Um, and then you go to California, yep. which is, again, back on the West Coast, lower down yep. than Seattle. And then you go back to essentially the middle of the country again to Texas yes. to catch up with Dr. Hook, yep. who are most well known for what is that Sylvia's mother song. And only 16. <laughs> she was 16. only 16. They sang that for me in their Wellington concert. Oh, you know, the only way that that story could be cooler is if Dr. Hook had written a song for, for you. Yeah. That's what an amazing, <laughs> amazing story. And I, for me, that's really, really important that we actually get that because yeah. that that story just kind of sums up for me that the, the crazy, crazy life that you've had. Yeah where nothing's been planned and it's all been chaos, but it's all kind of worked out. Well, it has. It really has, and I don't know how. <laughs> you know, because... <laughs> Hard so, to kill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 16 years old in a foreign country. Yeah. And young, impressionable, mm. you know, millions of things can go wrong. Yeah. You come back to New Zealand, you enter work as a sex worker again mm. where millions of things can go wrong mm. and then we're going to fast forward to you a cup of coffee and a chaplain yes <laughs> wow yeah just wow so i guess you can see why when i published i had to publish it as a memoir because if i'd written this as a novel people would have said oh for heaven's sake yeah you know Please. Exactly. I mean, I, I, I think most. I think it'd be fair to say most people would be really like, yeah, okay, yeah, you're yeah. Right. No, we, yeah, we, we're not going to publish that. There's just too much bullshit going on in there. Let's just trim, 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 trim. Yeah. Um. So, Let's put some normal stuff. Yeah, in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Had a stable life. <laughs> uh, so you, I don't even know where to go back. To. Okay, so let's let's go back to your you essentially finish your seven years of study. Yep. And you get your PhD? No, no. Um, it's a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. So you get that, and then you're, you're finished in Wellington? Yeah. Or where, where do you head off to from this point onwards? Well, I've been sort of travelling northwards all my life. Sure. So. Yeah. Because I mean, I, obviously you'd come to Auckland with your auntie. Yeah. And then, and then headed back. Back yep. to Wellington. Yeah. Yep. So I lived in Wellington for two, three years. I wanted to be a specialist in obstetrics and gynecology. Okay. But I found pretty quickly that somebody with issues of stress and depression, which has been a problem for me all my life. Sure. Yeah. And with yep. two kids, mm -hmm. one of whom's autistic and a wanderer, 
um, I couldn't do it. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I sat my part ones for that, which is like a big surgical examination, sat them in London and passed them. Okay. So academically yeah. I could have done it, but spiritually, mentally, I just couldn't. No, okay. Yeah. So, so I decided to be a GP. Right. Mm. Okay. And where's your first post? Newtown Union Health in Wellington. Right. Okay. Um, which is great. We worked with a lot of refugee populations. Yes. Um, a lot of lower decile people with really high health needs. Mm. Okay. It was fantastic. Right. It was yep. really, really good learning. Yep. And um, you're there for? About a year and a half, I think. And then I moved up to the Carpety Coast. I bought okay. a place up there. Right. Um, it was there that I I started to talk to a fellow GP a bit about my life. Right. Telling her stuff. Right. Trusting her to keep it in confidence. Yeah. And she started to feed little bits out into the community. Um, right. In fact, she did a public speech once. She was talking, I think it was about prostate cancer awareness. Okay. And she said that there was a GP living locally who shouldn't be looking after people because she couldn't look after herself. Wow, okay. And one of my patients told me this. Yeah. So I thought, you know, I'm about to mess up again here. My life has been so good because it was, it was yeah. great. And I've told this woman this stuff. Yeah. And she's feeding it out. Yeah. I need to take control of this. And that's when I started to write. That's where the... And that was part yeah. of the trigger. Um, also, I was friends with the taxi company up there. Because for a while there, I didn't have a car. And when I went out on house calls, I'd take a taxi. Okay, sure. And so the taxi driver said, oh, what are you doing? And I said, well, shit, I'm writing some stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they said, we'd like to read it. So the, the people from the Sunshine Taxi Company in Paraparumu yep. were the first readers of yep. what would become Bent Not Broken. Oh, shout out to the Sunshine They're Taxi Company. They're not there company. anymore. They're not there. No, no. Oh, terrible. Yeah, but they were my first readers. Wow. So going back to the, the original question, what made you mm. go from this is all for me, this yep. is all so I can learn, understand my past yep. to make changes to my future. Mm. What was the the moment that you sort of went, yeah, publishing yeah. is going to be what I do with this, this incredibly intimate and personal information? Yeah. Because it, it, it's not like you're going, well, I, you know, I had a couple of mental health issues mm, and mm. this is my life. You know, we, there's a lot of stuff that's gone on and we've... Yeah. And we've covered, I'm sure, just a, a very small yeah. snapshot of it. Yeah. But what made you go, okay, I want to share this with the world yeah. and don't care if I'm judged? It was realizing the power of writing it down mm -hmm. and finding out where things started to go wrong so that I could preempt them. Okay. It was knowing that that was really powerful and that that could help other people. Right. Again, that's that's sort of the the thing that you learnt, and when you went yeah. back to high school, yeah, um, your ability, your your desire to help others, yeah, as well. Okay, mm. right. Mm. So it really came from a place of um, wanting to connect with people through the written word, as opposed to yeah. uh, face to face. Yeah, well, a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love, I loved being a doctor. Yeah, you know, it was just the very best feeling. And um, just to to know things about people, to have people trust me enough to share really intimate stuff with me. Yeah. Sometimes that they'd never told anybody else about. Yeah, definitely. You know, and to be able to share that with them. I cried with some patients, you know. we. Yeah, I just loved it. It was great. So you, you publish your first book. Yeah. What's the what's the feedback? What what are the do is it reviewed? What what's the yeah. what, what what do you get given back from it? The feedback actually was mostly very good. Um, awesome. People said I could write. You know that was great. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Bennett wrote some snarky thing about um, the school of hard knocks. You know, right? And sort of took the Mickey a bit, but that's well, okay. It's Joe Bennett, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, 
Twat. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did an interview on Holmes. Yeah, okay. That was even before the book came out because I don't know how this happened, but a local paper got hold of the story that I was writing about my life. Okay. And that I was opening up about having been a sex worker. And it's just this little free paper, you know, that yeah, they, sure. they put in the letterbox <laughs> yeah. called Contact. And so we did this interview. It was really quite sweet. You mm-hmm. know? And when it came out, it was the front page. And it was the whole of the front page. And the headline was Stripper Prostitute Doctor with a picture of me walking along the beach. And it was like... Oh, shit. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh, shit. That is a hell of a headline. It's a hell of a headline. Yeah. Now, my dad rang me the night this came out because oh, yeah, yeah. this is a Wellington-wide paper. Yeah. And he found it because he was going to visit his parents who were living in a little flat in a retirement village. Yeah. And as dad pulled up, he got the mail out for them and yeah. this free newspaper and he saw it. And he was so upset that his parents would see it that he ran up and down the street and took the newspaper out of everyone's, everyone's letterbox. letterbox. <laughs> <laughs> and he rang me and gave me a blast yeah. too. Because did now how much of this did Dad know? Dad knew it all. Okay, yeah. right. Okay. And he was very, very proud of me, but very quietly proud of me. Yeah, sure. sure. You know? Yeah. And he didn't see why I had to tell people. Mm. So the first book comes out. Yep. You have the the article in the the free newspaper. Yep. That leads on to the uh, sit-down interview with Holmes. Yep. Well, with Julie, who was one of his people. It wasn't right. actually with him. Yep. Um, then I do an interview with Brian Edwards. Yes. Um, the book came out two weeks before I did the interview with Brian Edwards, I think. Mm-hmm. And 2,000 copies sold within a week of that. 2,000 copies. So the wow. whole print run yeah. ran out because of the Brian Edwards interview. Wow. Um, what happened then? Were you... This is the... Having kind of read the the little bit of information about you, you, you release this book and it's... It has its first run sellout. Yep. You get national publicity and exposure. Yep. You 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 release a second book. Yep. A couple of years later. Yep. Yep. The is it that you had more to tell, yep. or is it that there were things that were cut out of the first book that mm. you felt needed to be talked about? Tell me the journey behind the second book because that's yeah. that's another memoir. It is, and I I know that there are some musicians that have that have like multiple memoirs. Mm. I can think of um, Mark Chopper Reed. Mm-hmm. Um, he po- he wrote like five, six, seven, eight books, mm. all just based around his life. And I've always been curious as to know, you know, is it you you have more material for more than one book mm. or there are stories that you didn't remember or didn't share yeah talk me through that second book because that, that and in such a short space of time as well yeah the first book finished with me graduating from medical school right okay, okay. and there was an awful lot that happened after that yeah and to me it was being untruthful to finish the story on a high when actually I'd gone on to continue messing my life up for a bit. Right. Okay. So that's really what it was about. Um, The second book, now I probably wouldn't write. Oh. Even though it was truthful. Yeah. it, It was too exposing for some people in my family. And A little bit too confrontational. Just, yeah, a little bit too confrontational and... Sometimes you forget when you're writing memoir that you're actually writing other people's memoirs for them. Yeah. Ah, yes. And not in the way they would have written. Yeah. You know, because every one of us is the hero in our own story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And we won't tell the same stories. No, we all have different perspectives on certain events as well. Right. So you're writing your perspective about a certain set of events. Yeah. And obviously that upsets... Friends, family members, colleagues? Family members. Family members. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. And it was my mum's family who got most upset, even though they weren't identifiable as my family because they had different surnames. 
Right. My right. dad's okay. fam- yep. my dad's family who were very identifiable. Yeah. Um, they were less upset. So go figure. Okay. But wow. when we're talking about perspective, you know, at the yes. beginning, I talked about how my mum strangled me and my sister Tracy saw it. Yes, we were talking about perspective. Yeah. So we were both in the room when this happened. Right, yes. I yep. very clearly remember that my mother grabbed me around the throat, mm-hmm. knocked me to the ground, kneeled astride me and strangled me till I lost consciousness. Okay. So I was there. I remember that really clearly. Yep. Tracy remembers really clearly that mum was standing up the whole time, as was I, and she strangled me until I lost consciousness. And collapsed we on were the ground. Bo- yes. So we wow. were both there and we were both witnesses yep. to a really traumatic event. Neither of us is lying, but we both remember it well, that's, so differently. Yeah, the interpretation of events. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, so it made me think about perspective. Yeah. And then as are you thinking about perspective as you're writing this second book? Or is that why you have the... Is regret the right word? or I don't know that regret's the right word, but I think... Yeah, would you, would you, yeah. Would you have, you'd have changed some of the, the content? Possibly. I could have been more protective of me. There's some stuff I don't want to talk about, and yep. I could have been sure. more protective yeah. of someone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, and look, you know, that, that that totally makes sense because, you know, at the end of the day, when we're sort of talking about our journey and stuff like that, um, sometimes we do run the risk of, of hurting others inadvertently. Yeah. Inadvertently. Yeah. Or even deliberately, and then afterwards thinking, well, actually, that was a bit of a, a yeah. low blow. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, and, and time can heal old wounds as well. So yeah. when you're intentionally trying to hurt someone, 20 years down the track, you may not feel that way. That's right. Yeah. Mm. It's sort of very much in the moment. Now, you you, you write these two books, 2000, 2002, and then you, you're a GP. Yep. Um, you migrate your way to Whangarei. Yep. And you're a GP here for how many years? Six years, I think. Six in Carmel. Years. In yeah. Carmel? Uh, yeah. Three Mile Bush Road. That's it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, three mile Bush Road, Bush Road Medical, Medical Center. Center. That's, That's the one. It. That's yeah. the one. Yeah. And you, but you're no longer there, are you? No. On my way towards Bush Road, I lived in Napier for a while. Yes. And I Love did Napier. Iron Man. You know Iron Man? You I know swim three movie. point. No, 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 no. Oh, the, the sporting the, event. The sporting event Iron Man. Yep. You yep. swim three point eight kilometers. Yep. You cycle one hundred and eighty k. Then you run a marathon. Yep. Well, I did one of those. Congratulations! That's yeah. a huge achievement. In two thousand and seven, and in twenty twelve, I was training to do the second one, and I had a fall doing yoga. And in the fall, I prolapsed three discs in my back. Okay. And I had back surgery after the Iron Man event. Yeah. Um, and in the course of the surgery, something happened to my spinal cord. So okay. there was a medical misadventure. Right. Um, and I ended up with a condition called arachnoiditis. Mm-hmm. Now, the spinal cord and the brain are covered by three layers called meninges. That's where meningitis comes from. Right. Okay. That's inflammation of the meninges. Yeah. Well, one of the meninges is called the arachnoid layer because it looks like a spider web. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And if that's injured, mm-hmm. it creates an inflammatory mass that traps all of the nerves. Yeah. So I had this injury that affected all the nerves from my waist down. So I couldn't run because if I tried to run, I'd fall over. Sure. I couldn't swim because my legs didn't work properly. And right. if I got out of the pool, I couldn't walk. Yeah. I couldn't cycle because I can't sit on a bike seat for yep. that long. Okay. So suddenly that part of my being, mm-hmm. that part of my identity yeah. disappeared. Yeah. Because the, as, as you as you sort of said earlier, um, when you were talking about how sometimes you're waiting for, the waiting for the other shoe to, to drop. Fall off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you talk about doing something different, and you mentioned exercise. Yes. Um, yeah. Exercise is obviously something that's kind of become a, a bit of a core part of your identity. It has, yeah. And then for that accident to happen, for a little bit of that to be taken away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what happens, sort of after the incident and the in the in the medical malpractice? Yeah, I 
for a while I was better mm -hmm. from the prolapse discs, but gradually the more I exercised, the more I started to fall over and to have funny neurological symptoms in my legs. Okay. And um, arachnoiditis is incurable and progressive. It's a pain disorder and a mobility disorder. So I trip and fall easily and I walk a bit funny sometimes, especially if I've been sitting down for a while. Sure. Um, so I started to tell my patients, if you see me in town and I'm trying to hurry across the road and it looks like I'm drunk, I'm not. It's just that my legs don't always work yeah. that well. Yeah. But soon the pain got too much. and Right. Yeah. Yeah. The okay. neurological stuff was too much. Yeah. And I wasn't as compassionate or as kind or as curious as I wanted to be as a doctor. So I pulled the pin on my medical career. Was that sort of something that you just did gradually? Or? Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you sort of slowly wound yourself down. I did. Yeah. Right. Um, how hard was that? It was really hard. Yeah. It was really, really hard because becoming a doctor was a huge thing. I was the first person on my mother's side of the family to go to university. Yeah. For generations, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, my dad's brother had been to university in the States. He got a tennis scholarship. Um, but nobody else had. You know, and after me, quite a few of my cousins went to university, and I hope that I helped to open that way for them. You pioneer. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So it was a big thing, and the communication with people was such a big part of my life. Yeah. Okay. So you've you've essentially wound down your time as a, a GP. Yeah. But you've decided to make a another segue yes and north tech mm. north tech is calling and, tech. and now what did you do at north tech i did a year and a half of writing yeah i did um, a level six half year and then full level seven year mm -hmm. and for level seven i wrote a novel called mila and the bone man yeah um, okay which is going to be released on August the 18th this year. Which is why we're here. Yeah, yeah. So Mila was mentored by Pip Adam, who's an amazing New Zealand writer. Yes. North Tech, their creative writing program, I think they're the only polytechnic who's doing creative writing in the whole of New Zealand. Wow. And it's world class. Yeah. It's absolutely world class. They've got amazing mentors, great teachers can't recommend it highly enough okay so you go do half a year of level six yeah level seven yeah just absolutely nail it and you yep. write this wonderful book yes the year after that yes. which is last year i did a master's in creative writing through aut yeah and i wrote a book called songs to sing to the dying i got first class honors for it that book will be out probably in a couple of years Wow. So, so this is, we're really getting a scoop here. Yeah, you are. So you not only have you got one book coming out of this, yeah. you're going to have another book in a year yeah. or two's time. Yes. And wow. there's a third book, which is currently with some editors in the United Kingdom, called The Anatomist's Handbook. So, three books. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have three books come out in, what, a five-year period? I think so, yeah. And all... All from the, what was it, stripper prostitute doctor that yep. was <laughs> headlines? Yes. Oh, my goodness. So <laughs> let's talk about the book that we've got coming out this yep. year because obviously as the other ones come, we're going to get you back in. Good, great. Because that, that, those conversations are going to be absolutely amazing. Yep. Let's talk about that. What is the book about? Um, okay, Mila and the Bone Man. Mila is Mila. A, yep. Yeah, she's a young woman who lives in Northland. Okay. Up near the forest near Russell. Right, yep, okay. yep. Um, I conceived the book when I was walking, well, kind of staggering, through the Pukanui Forest. Yeah. So Mila is about 12 in the book. Okay. She has a friend called Tommy who lives next door, and to Tommy's on the autism spectrum. Sure. Tommy finds a human hand in the forest, or okay. the bones of a human hand. Okay. And takes them to Mila. Yep. Now, Mila's quite clever. She knows who the hand belongs to. And she okay. and Tommy yep. 
reinter the bones or the skeleton of this man yeah. in the forest where no one will walk on him, no one will harm him. And Mila learns the story of why the man was killed in the forest because Tommy was a witness to what happened. So I can't tell you too much more without wrecking the story, but it's a story set in Northland, yeah. set in the bush. Mila um, comes from Croatian ancestry. Okay, yeah. Tommy lives with his grandmother, who is part Māori. Mm-hmm. She and Mila and Mila's family are healers, yeah. using the different traditions, the old and the new together. Right, so they're combining traditional Māori and and, and modern, Croatian and, and Croatian, yes, yep. and modern Western medicine. Okay, wow. So Mila works for a while as a um, a hand holder in Auckland Hospital. So, yeah, that it's... is unbelievable. Where where does the inspiration for something like that come from? You yeah, you know you you've you've gone out for this walk. Yep. Um. Do you yourself stumble across a hand? No. no thank God. No, um. <laughs> what happened was <laughs> I was walking. Actually, this was in A.H. Reed Park okay. when, when the idea came. Yeah. I was walking along one of the tracks there, and there were all these joggers in their lycra. Now, I used to wear lycra and jog. Sure. That's cool. Okay, yep. But no judgment for the lycra. No, 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 no. But here's Cody dieback, right? Yep. So what we all have to do is disinfect our shoes before we walk in the forest. Yes. Okay? Yep. But these joggers were jumping over the disinfection stations and checking their watches because to them, their extra 10 seconds of washing their shoes yeah. was not worth their time. It's an inconvenience. Yep. 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 And I thought, how would it feel for someone who was brought up in the forest, who knew the forest as a living breathing entity mm, mm-hmm. that surrounded their life. Yeah. How would that person feel when they saw that sort of stuff happening? And I started to think of this young woman with a good relationship with the forest. Okay. And how the Nahiri is a it's a healing space. Yes. But here's these people who are too important to take care of it. Filled with their own self importance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then did you sort of develop the initial concept in the year six or sort of Mm. in the year seven? Year seven. Year seven. Okay. Um, And this is obviously where the 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 wonderful course and the tutors and the assistance yeah. from North Tech come from. Yeah. You do. You, what is the, what process did you go through to sort of you know you've you've got this initial seed of an idea in your head. Yeah. Um. How do you sort of go through it with with actors? What they'll often do is they'll often workshop things. Yeah. Um, musicians will often um you know sit down with. Musician, you know, fellow musicians in the band, and they'll mm, sort of structure mm. things out. But writing's very, it's very single person. Yeah, but in a course like North Tech, you have classmates. Yes, and you workshop your chapters as you write them. Right. So I would read their chapters, they would read my chapters, yep. and we would give each other feedback. Okay. We were writing in different genres. Yeah. Um, two of them were writing fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, one was doing podcasts on true crime. True female criminals right. in New Zealand. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Yep. I can think of at least one. Yep. Heavenly Creatures. Great yes. movie. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Kerry Hume? Yeah, and <laughs> Minnie D. Oh, really? Remember Minnie D, my baby farmer? I do. Yep. Wow, yeah. that's going back. Yeah, it is. Okay, yeah. so you're you're as you're writing chapters, yep. you're sort of workshopping everything, yes, and they're providing you with feedback as yes. to what they like, what they, you know, if there's any minor changes that need to be made. Yeah. How long does it take for you to go from initial concept through to essentially completion before it gets handed off to, or before it gets you know, bound together yeah. and then sent off to publishing houses for mm. a- approval or... Yeah, it took, I think, six months to write Mela. And wow. then there's the editing process, working yeah. through it too, yeah. you know, and tidying it up. Yeah. I finished it three years ago and it's only now going to publication. So it's been slowed down by COVID. Um, all sorts of things yeah, have slowed it course, down. There's course. a worldwide paper shortage partly caused by COVID, partly by the war in Ukraine. So all sorts of things wow. get in the way of a book coming out. Yeah. I, okay. COVID, I would understand. Yep. But a paper shortage. Yeah. yeah. 
who would have thought? Yeah. Who would have thought? That's that's crazy. So mm. you've got so six months mm. to write a book, but then yeah. essentially two and a half years yeah. worth of editing. Now, uh, as someone who's not a writer, mm. um, you know, but I mean, I've uh, I've, I've certainly written songs and lyrics and stuff like that. Um, is it is the, is that sort of process very collaborative between yourself and the editor? Or do they yeah. sort of sit down and go, cut, 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 and then you know, mm. redo, redo? It depends. Okay. Yeah. What I did with Mila is I wrote the full manuscript. Sure. Had the editing process through North Tech and with Pip Adam. Yes. Which was really helpful. Then I sent it to my agent who shopped it around some publishers. Then right. the publisher accepts it and gets an editor to work on it, yes. to tighten it or change it. Yep. Um, there was very little that we needed to do editorial-wise, which was great. And that's because that work's already been kind of, a lot of that work's been done already. A lot of it's been done. Right. Yeah. Yep, I'm cool. also a pretty good self-editor now. Oh, good. So okay. you, you become better at that yep. with time. Yep. Um, then you get concepts for the cover. What words did I want from the text? Yes. What kind of imagery did I want on the cover? What was it to look like? Yeah. So the publisher does all of that stuff. Right. The author has final approval. Okay. Okay. I tend to say, you know, you guys are experts in that. Please, you do that. I'll write the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You do the other stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, that August 18th yeah. is when... That is, it's got, it's an official launch. It is. Now that is hardback? Paperback. Paperback. Yeah. Um, and digitally as well? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. All of those rights are all negotiated separately and I just leave it to my agent to do that stuff. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I might make an audio book of it once. I did do an audio book of Bent Not Broken. Really? Um, yeah. I, I had a little microphone and I used Garage Band. Oh, on your on a on an iPhone. On an iPad. iPhone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. And sent it to a US publisher who put it all together. So Bent Not Broken somewhere is on audio. Um he used amazing. to sell it on yeah. yeah, on these little USB sticks that you just plugged in and yep. it played you the book. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow. So that but that's obviously something that will come a bit later on. It will. Right. Yeah. So at the moment the rights for the paperback are the ones that have been yes. finalized. Now <clears throat> With um, essentially over time, as you know, I mean, I ran a bookstore many, many years ago. I ran a yeah. paper plus in Auckland, um, but bookstores are now sort of not as mm. not as widely spread. You know, I think we've still got Whitcalls, Paper Plus, and yeah. you can buy books through the warehouse and, yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. If I was to go and find this book, where where am I going? Where am I looking? All to, to good bookshops. All good bookshops. Yes. Now, is, uh, now, obviously, the <laughs> book's written by a Northlander. Yeah. The book uh, is, features Northland as a main character. Yeah. Does Northland get the exclusive official first launch, or does it go nationwide all at once? It will go nationwide all at once. Mm. I'm not sure yet whether there will be a physical launch because of COVID and because yeah. of all sorts of things. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't want to gather. We might do a virtual, a Zoom launch. That I would, know yeah. quite a few authors have done that. Yeah. But I will let you know and you can let people know. Please. That would be amazing because okay. one of the things with the podcast is to support all, yeah. all talent, um, artistic people in, in any way possible. So please let us know and we'll we'll do we'll a special do. little um we'll do a special little video for it. But thank you. That is amazing. So the the name of the book is Mila and the Bone Man. Mila and the Bone Man. Now yeah. I, I get the Mila, the Bone Man. Don't if it if it has some significance, don't spoil yeah. it. No, Tommy, her friend, yes, makes um, models out of bones he finds in the forest or on the beach. Yeah. So he makes mobiles and models. Right. And he calls himself the Bone, bone Man. Man. So it's really the story of the two of them. Yes, but there's also a dead man in the forest who's only bones. So ah, you know, could, choose yeah, your yeah, own exactly, bone man. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> wow. Um, where can people find 
you this wonderful pool of information where yeah. where can they where can they reach out to you i am on facebook yes twitter yes. instagram and tumblr as yes. lauren roche yep um my facebook was recently hacked so I've opened up a new Facebook account. There's a bit of that going around at the moment. There's a bit it? of that going around. They posted pro-ISIS stuff. Yes. And I've been locked out for 20 days now. Yeah. So. Uh, actually, that happened to a friend of mine over the weekend. Yeah. He got hacked and apparently there was a whole bunch of things that if you clicked links, all manner of inappropriate stuff came up. But yeah. that's terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Just... So you've got a brand new Facebook page. I have. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. But... um. Instagram, Twitter, yeah, um, Tumblr, and Tumblr, yeah, um, and it's all Lauren Roche, Roche. Or um, Lauren underscore Roche, or Twitter is Doctor Bob sixty one, because when I was a rugby doctor, they knew me as Doctor Bob, short for Kate. Which, if you're a Black Adder fan, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think I know the reference. That's yes. from I want to say Black Adder goes forth. No, 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 it's one of the black adders with Queenie in it. Oh, oh, the highwayman Bob short oh, for Kate. Oh, my goodness, highway I woman love slack bladder. Yes, yes, uh, is it um Lord Flashheart? Oh, wasn't Rick he Mayle. wonderful? It's, it's, a, it's just one of the best characters ever. Yeah, so good. <laughs> oh, look, Lauren, thank you so much. So just unbelievable mm. absolutely unbelievable to have you come in and sit down and talk with us today mm. about your your journey mm. what you've been through and um mila um because she sounds like a truly multicultural but really rich deep character as well yeah. i'll be uh you know i've been looking for a good book to read for a while so i don't have to wait too long so 18th of August. Yes. That's the release date. That's a Wednesday. Thursday? Wednesday or Thursday. Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. I think the publisher just picked the date out of the air because I was hassling it. Right. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Looking for a release date to go. So this one will do yeah. it. Um, so thank you again very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank and um, yeah, we look forward to sitting down with you very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there we go, everyone. Bit outside of the norm of what we do, but... It was one of those podcasts that were that has such depth and gravitas to it that um, I really wanted to be able to cover it again um, and kind of bring it back to people's light. Um, Lauren's journey is, um, you know, um, ama- you know, I could throw the usual words around: amazing, unbelievable. You know, you you throw you throw all these hyperbolic words around, but it really is unique and you know i mean i'm i'm 48 and i've never in my lifetime met anyone that's gone on half the adventures that lauren has and it's just it's just unreal um you know whether it be her time as a prostitute her time stowing away on a boat um to go to america um how she became a doctor um, and then how she became, you know, a, a best-selling author. You know, her her two autobiographies, and and then her her book that she launched around this time last year, Mila and the Bone Man. Um, you know, she is a, a woman that's gone through. Uh, Producer Andrew, yes. w- would it be fair to say that Lauren's gone through a lot? <laughs> Uh, that'd be almost an understatement. Yeah, uh, she's, um, she's she's lived like twice the life already. You know, she like, has. And yeah. still so much more to go. It's just, uh, yeah, that stowaway story still gets me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tell people every time, I'm like, start with that one. It's crazy stories on there. Definitely. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, you know, as I said in the intro, it's one of the podcasts I felt the most criminally underprepared for. Yeah. Um, but also, I mean, I don't, so I, I, I don't have a degree in journalism or anything like that. I just enjoy sitting down and talking with people and getting to know them. Um. But as I've said it a few times, and I've, I know I've said it quite a lot to some of our guests, um, it was probably one of those very one of those few occasions where I felt like a complete fraud. Um, I was sitting here this whole time, being completely blown away by how amazing and open Lauren was, and I was just I, I remember I remember sitting here going, I have no idea what I'm doing. 
and I'm not prepared for this, but man, she she made it easy, and it was a lot of fun, and we got through it, and she is uh, a, a, such a, a wonderful human being. Um, since this, uh, you know, since their podcast came out originally, um, she had also invited me to um mc uh her book launch which was held at the library um earlier on uh in 2023 um and that was cool we kind of you know it was, it was great we had you know there was some drinks and nibbles and stuff and um we kind of did an informal podcast uh in front of an audience of it was about i think it was about 50 people it was a lot of fun we had a good night um and it was super cool so um uh lauren when uh, when the second book is due, um, we're gonna get you back into this into this chair. What's well, a new chair now? We've got new studio, new chairs, um, and it'll be super cool to chat with you, kind of catch up, and um, just find out where you are. I I and I follow you on social media, so I know what you get up to. It's very cool. Your dog is the cutest thing as well. Um, I'm gonna flick to my camera. Um, you know, going back and, and revisiting this podcast was, was interesting. Producer Andrew. Hello. What would you say, out of the the vast multitude of stories that she shared with us, what is kind of the one that stands out for you back, you know, when we when we originally filmed this versus sort of thinking about, um, about now? For this podcast specifically yeah for lauren she, yeah. she got she got deported from america too eh? yeah she yeah. did yeah i've still yeah i i just think the whole journey i can't i can't pick yeah. any one part of it like S- stowing just away so much on, in there yeah stowing away on a boat not being able to go number twos for yeah a couple of weeks only being able to go number ones um, and like she traveled illegally through the states it yeah just, you know yeah that, that <laughs> i don't mean to be dark but they've shot people for less over there you know <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they they really staunch on that, so I can't very, believe she got as far as she did. Very dark. Well, I think it was also a different time as well. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, no, um, crazy story from start to finish. Uh, just it, just different. It it's pretty much different lives. Every story is almost a different life. You know, and that that raises a really good point. When whenever we get a new guest coming into the studio, um, you know. Everyone gets sent um, a form beforehand, and it's a little bit of a blurb about what the podcast is, and then um, we get them to fill out some basic information, a little bit about their background, a little bit about their expression, uh, their creative expression, um, you know, who their inspirations are, what they've got coming up, and if there are any topics that we, you know, they don't wish for us to talk about. Um, for her, you know, I, I go back and look at that form again, and I... I realized just how much more she gave us on the night that we filmed that. Mm, true that. Um, the, there were so many funny moments in there and so many heartbreaking moments. Um, the one, one of the funny moments when she is um, a nurse at a Wellington hospital and she runs into a priest who used to be her old pimp. <laughs> oh, what are the odds of that? What are the odds of that? That's, that's crazy. Um, and then her becoming a certified doctor and then, um, you know, doing triathlons and then having a back injury, you know, and then forcing herself to reevaluate her life once again and figure out where she goes. I mean, she's she's a woman who's lived so many different lives. Yeah, it's been all walks in one. It has, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, the funny stories are funny. The the, the dark stories are, are, are you know, they, they I believe they show a real testament to who we are as a person and, and the inner strength that we can have sometimes. Um, so for me, there's no one particular moment that I'm going to pinpoint because for me, the whole conversation is just, just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And again, Lauren, thank you so much. We're going to love having you come on. Um, when the the book after Mila and the Bone Man is done, um, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about more where you uh, listeners can find this because you know what we're finding is that we're getting all these new people come on and this is great, um, and we encourage you know we we're doing these as a short series to really 
highlight some of the the key podcasts that we've had earlier on to kind of encourage people to go back and and listen or watch them and check them out. So where can you, the uh, wonderful listener or viewer, find out more about us? Well, for the visuals, you can go to Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, all Northland Artists Conversation. For the audio, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Again, Northland Artist Conversation. And if uh, you uh, would like to come in and sit down in the chair, or we can do a video chat as well, um, and we can record it that way, we would love to hear from you. Um, the email address for you to reach out to us is hello at northlandartistconversation.co.nz. We, honestly, we would love to hear from you. Um, we have had some amazing guests uh, come and be part um, of, of this just simply by watching or listening to another podcast and going, yeah, I could do that. That would be fun. That would be wicked. Um, and now we also have a Patreon page as well um, where you can support us a little bit more. Um, you, we have two tiers. Uh, the first tier is a cup of coffee, and that's five bucks a month. That's just a little way of saying we love your content, we love what you do, we just want to support you. Um, here you go. Second tier we have is affectionately called coffee addict and what that is is it's 20 bucks a month but you do get a few extras that you don't get with the other tiers you get um to know what guests are coming up um if you would like me to ask those guests a question you can do that um and you also get a bit of a shout out as well um so i'm going to do yeah i'm going to do those shout outs now so first off i'm going to give i'm going to do them i'm going to do them backwards with a very specific reason why first one is jenny purchase jenny thank you so much for supporting us um and thank you for coming in and sitting down with us um your book shouldn't be too far away so that'll actually be quite cool um Next, we've got Maggie Coco. Uh, Maggie, uh, I saw on Facebook today that you're currently out of Northland and touring. Good for you. Uh, definitely going to try and get you back in. Um, Science for Sociopaths looks like it's been an absolute success. Uh, so we, we do need to talk about that. Uh, thirdly, we've got Michael Boater. Um, he has got um, his uh, new uh, book of... Uh, horror short stories coming out of the anthology book um blood alcohol um it's very gris it's very dark it's got a uh it's got a girl that looks like she's been at the beach and she's got blood smeared all over her face it's very very gruesome but look, it is very cool um and our very first patron the one the only lauren roach she was the first she uh joined up and um, she still continues to support us this day. So, Lauren, thank you again so much. Um, so, where can you find us? Well, you can go to Google, type in Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Um, and just click on the link. Top right-hand corner. Um, create an account, log in, sign up, do all that sort of good stuff. Then type in Northland Artists Conversation or one word. You'll find us. Pick your tier. Go from there. The next even easier way that you can do it is to go patreon.com forward slash north and artist conversation yep it's all nice and easy one word um create your um account pick your tier go from there happy days um yeah nice and easy really i'm gonna flick to my wide um and here we are so we are v we're this close to christmas now this close and um it's it's going to be a good christmas and a good new year's um we've got some amazing surprises coming up in the new year we've got some very cool things happening and uh we are definitely looking forward to sharing all of them uh, with every single one of our guests that's been on and every single one of you that has watched a podcast or listened to a podcast and has supported what we do um so on that lovingly high note Thank you very much for tuning into the Northern Artist Conversation. My name is Mark Kelly. We will see you guys real soon.